back. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Thanks, Dad. be on now am I yep beauty well good morning everyone it's um it's great that I can um we can celebrate together join together like this and open up God's word I think most of you know me but if you don't my name's Ben and I've been a part of this church for almost 12 years now so it's my pleasure to be able to bring you uh, God's word as we work through it today there's a fair bit in these verses there's destruction suffering um, opposition um, so it may feel a little bit difficult, may feel a bit uncomfortable, but it's my hope that by the end of this morning, you're going to rest in the saving grace of God and uh, trust in his gospel. But before we do that, I think it's um, great that we come before God in prayer. I know we've all been sitting down for a little while, so why don't we stand and we'll pray together. Heavenly Father, We thank you again that we can sit here this morning and open your word, the Bible. Please illuminate these words by the power of your Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and open our minds again afresh so that we all leave here uh, changed again this morning. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So please grab a seat and keep your Bibles open because none of this authority comes from me, but it comes from Scripture. So I think it would be fair to say that many of us here in Australia, including us in this room, live with the hope of a life of smooth sailing. We don't want any hiccups or bumps along the way. We can almost sometimes be shocked when um, these happen, when bad stuff happens. We know bad stuff happens to other people, you know, but not to us. But this isn't the reality, is it? The reality is that there's always has and there always will be times of trial and distress. Now, to be fair, we do see the best and the worst in people, even in the times of ease. But it's often when people's true character, who they really are, or what's important to them, um, that's what's revealed in hard times. Think about here in Australia, what we've seen in the recent years. We've had the times of intense bushfires, and during these times we've seen communities unite, men and women willing to um, risk their own life to save people and property. We've seen others who are willing to clean up after wild storms or even risk their own lives to rescue people from flood water. It's not hard for us uh, in this room here to remember the drought that gripped New South Wales a few years ago. This drought also saw people dig into their pockets for help with donations or other support. There was communities that rallied together They organised convoys of hay bales and brought them from Western Australia all the way to New South Wales to distribute to farmers and stock that were in so much need. See, there was a spokesman for one of these organisations who, when asked, said this, it's the Australian tradition of care and compassion. It's helping your mates out when they're in need. But sadly, though, there's always another side to it. For some, when times get tough, their social regard or morals are compromised. You've only got to look at the last 12 months in Australia. I mean, by by far we've escaped the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic, but we haven't escaped some of the worst displays of human behaviour. 
You're seeing retail staff getting abused. People are hoarding. People are being so selfish, fighting each other in the, toil- uh, in the shopping centres over toilet paper. I mean, you'd remember that it got so bad last year that the Prime Minister got on television and said, stop it. This isn't helpful. It's ridiculous and it's un-Australian. See, we've got some wonderful advantages that come with our Australian citizenship, but it also comes with an expectation. We're to live our lives in accordance with our citizenship. So whether in good times or in the hard, we conduct ourselves with the ideals of this country. See, and it was no different for the church in Philippi. Philippi had been made a colony of the Roman Empire. The city itself had been modelled off the mother city, Rome. Roman architecture filled this province, and Roman, sorry, retired Roman soldiers were given allotments of land. The members of this church were Roman citizens. They had their names written on the rolls in Rome. They enjoyed prestige. They enjoyed benefits that came from being a citizen, benefits that weren't available to those outside. But in turn, there were standards. They were expected to live in a manner worthy of their citizenship. See, we can't all be you know, the Forbes Australian Citizen of the Year, but we all want to behave as good citizens of this country. Sorry, Murray. <laughs> we're, we're told to honour government. <laughs> we're, we're told to honour our governments. We're told to give to Caesar what is Caesar's. See, we don't want our gospel witness to be unnecessar- unnecessarily hampered by us deliberately being difficult. But greater than this earthly kingdom, we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom, and that is going to be our focus today. So Murray's already reminded us about the f- last few weeks in um, the book of Philippians, seeing Paul pray for the Philippian, Philippians, seeing how Paul's life didn't focus on himself, but it was for the advancement of the gospel. We saw how he was willing to suffer for the gospel and that whether he lived or died, his life was for Christ. And that's what we're going to focus on today. When Paul exhorts us to live the same way, to live in a manner worthy of the gospel, We're going to see an appeal to live united in the gospel. And we're finally, we're going to see how suffering is an evidence of God's grace. But first, we'll start where Paul starts. So whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. See, the NIV starts with the word, whatever happens. You may be using a translation that uses the word only. Whatever translation you're using, the meaning's the same. Paul is giving us one command. He's saying, whether I come and see you or not, live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. See, the gospel of Christ, this is, this is the greatest announcement the world has heard. It reminds us that the whole world has and still is living in rebellion to God. There's en- people are enemies of God. They're sitting under his judgment and under his holy wrath. But yet, it's through Jesus, those who repent and believe in him have been given salvation through his substitutionary death and his sinless life. This is Jesus, the Son of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who holds all things in the palm of his hand, the one who stepped into creation, truly God, truly man, who took our sin and our transgression. He stood where we should have stood. He took the punishment we should have taken. We deserve death, but he took it. He bore it on the cross as he shed his blood, as he hung and as he died. And it's this same Jesus who was buried, this same Jesus who was resurrected and is now sitting at the right hand of the Father in in heaven and in future is coming in judgment. And he's also coming to claim those who are his. See, if you're listening today and you're not yet a Christian, or maybe you're still new in your faith, this is what we mean when we say gospel. This gospel means good news. This is the good news that Jesus came that he step, God stepped into the creation to redeem a people, to call them back to himself, all those who will believe on him and confess their need and brokenness. But for many of us in this room here, 
we already confess Jesus. We still need to continually remind ourselves and each other. Because when we stop, all that we're doing is creating behavior modification. The last thing we want to do is know how to act or behave as a Christian, yet have the charge against us that we forsake our first love. So let's remember that we're citizens of his kingdom. We are his, and being found in Jesus is of infinite value. Please don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying we act or have to behave in a certain way to gain his grace. It's all by God. We're saved because of him. We work out of our salvation. We're not working for it. But continually, we need to grasp this. We need to want to live as heavenly citizens in this earthly um, homeland. We want to make Christ supreme. We want to live for him, concerned for the mission of his gospel, wherever he places us, in this town or another city. And we want more people to come to faith in Jesus. And then he moves on to remind us again that this is never in isolation. See, we are in him, together, united by the Holy Spirit and surrounded by the community he has placed us in. If you look at this now, it doesn't always come out, but you've got to remember that Paul isn't issuing a threat. This isn't a, I can't wait till I come and see you. This is a letter of friendship. This is Paul longing to join them, to come and um, share in the joy of Christ. And if he can't to physically, or to physically come to see them, he wants to know they're standing f- firm in their faith. Think about uh, if we had a, a previous pastor or a previous member of this church come to visit us. See, they wouldn't want to come back and have to straighten us out. You know, they'd be, they'd, their longing would be to come back and return as a friend, to share in the joy of Jesus and to see us standing firm together. So living in the kingdom of Jesus, living with the, the view of his infinite worth, and we're united as one, Paul now moves on to tell us to stand firm. See, Paul here is employing military language. This wouldn't have been lost on members of the congregation who were retired soldiers. But we get the image, don't we? This is soldiers standing side by side. You know, they've got their shields locked together. They're not giving the enemy an inch. You can imagine what would happen if one of these soldiers decided to take a step back and give the enemy a foothold, or thought he could stand on his own and do it himself. It would, it's not going to end well. And that's the same for us. We need to stand firm together in the gospel. We're not to try and move on. We're not to try and step back. We don't want to see just how much of the world we can take in. We need, we want to stand as one. We need to contend for the faith of the unity and remember that we're united in him. Because it's not a case of if opposition will come, but it's when. But it's through opposition that we're going to see evidence of God's grace. Remember the words of John, no, sorry, Jesus in John chapter 15. Jesus reminds us, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. We're opposed because we are in Jesus. Four times in this letter, Paul speaks of opposition. He speaks of opposition from outside the church, and he speaks of tension, opposition from within. Right now, Paul is speaking to us about opposition from the outside. Non-Christians, non, uh, Roman non-Christians trying to intimidate Christians. Remember how the emperor was treated like a god in Rome. There was an emperor cult. He was given divine titles such as Lord or Saviour. And publicly it was proclaimed, Caesar is Lord. We can um, imagine the strong feelings returned, sorry, retired soldiers would have for the emperor. These are men who'd spent their life fighting and serving Caesar. These are men who'd lived to advance the Roman kingdom. 
it's not hard to see how they how hostility would be aroused when Christians are, would no longer say Caesar is Lord, but only Jesus is Lord. So just like these Philippians, we need to expect opposition. We might not have to ex- um, confess that the Prime Minister or the Queen is Lord, but think about what's said in Australia about religion. It's okay to have your own God, but you're not to jam it down anyone's throat. Or now we're hearing about being tolerant or being inclusive, which we all know that what they're trying to promote is anything but. But that's not my point. My point is that whenever we exclaim or exclusively say that Jesus is Lord, we're going to be opposed. But we don't have to be frightened because when we're united together, unmoved from our foundations, the church can and will withstand the most terrifying opposition. Look at where the church is growing the most. Look at where the greatest population of Christians is. It's where persecution is the greatest. Why do you think governments now in Australia and across the world are trying to ban praying, even silently, outside certain venues? Because they know a church united in God cannot be stopped. So what do you see? You see that this, this is a sign. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed and that we will be saved and that that's from God. So we need to see sign as an indicator. A sign is something that is seen and that's recognised. See, it may be difficult to see exactly how non-Christians see their destruction. And while we can debate it, we can speculate, it's not the most important thing. We need, as Christians, to see that this is a sign, a sign of God's grace. See, Paul says, you will be saved. He's not just talking about a future event, but he's talking about the here and now. Paul is saying, the courage to live, the courage to live and die for the exaltation of Christ is a sign that you've genuinely been converted to Christ. And then Paul says, and that by God. See, this almost feels just a bit tacked on, but it's just another beautiful reminder that all aspects of our salvation, the, our ability to believe, our ability to stand firm, our ability to exalt Jesus, even in the face of opposition, even to the point of death, all comes from God. And now Paul is going to conclude with an explanation on suffering. So we need to see that salvation by God does not exclude suffering. So we might be able to accept opposition, but suffering, that's another, another thing, isn't it? Maybe that's come from our Western culture. Maybe we still see that as hard to grasp because it's only now that Australia is starting, starting to move into a post-Christian nation. Maybe that's come because we've listened to the wrong teachers, those who have pushed a health and wealth prosperity gospel. Those who are claiming now a word of faith movement, thinking they can declare victory over these situations. But, but it's not right, is it? Like, look at throughout the Bible. Suffering always advances the gospel. Suffering is repeated. Look what Paul says now, 20, uh, in verses 29. For it has been granted to you to, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to suffer for him since you were going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. To grant something, that's to give something freely, it's to give something graciously. So we may be able to accept that we've been freely given the gift of faith, but we've been given graciously suffering. Suffering for Christ is a blessing because it reminds us yet again that Christ's favour rests on us. He has chosen us. He has chosen to display himself through us, through his church, and to advance his kingdom. But sometimes we need more than just the facts. Sometimes we want to see how this works itself out. This is why Paul finishes by offering them encouragement. They're they're experiencing the same struggle he experienced. See, the word struggle, we, we we translate the word struggle, 
but a better word for it is agony. So they knew of Paul's situation. They knew that he was in chains. But more than that, they knew of his agony. Perhaps the ones sitting there reading this for the first time were actually even the cause of his suffering. They were, but now they were seated in the church. But how can I say that? Because if when we look at Acts chapter 16, we see that Paul on his second missionary journey came to Philippi. He brought the gospel to a small group of women who had gathered on the riverbank. Starting with Lydia, he preached and the people were converted. A church was formed, but yet with it came opposition. Paul and Silas were dragged before the magistrates. They were severely flogged and they were thrown into prison. But Paul continued to preach. And through this suffering, the jailer and his whole family heard the gospel. And the jailer and his whole family believed in God. See, God was at work in Paul. And God is at work in us. See how suffering advances the gospel. See how suffering exalts God. And through it, we know and experience God's grace. Am I good now? All right. So how are we to apply these verses to ourselves today? What can we take away as we ponder Paul's appeal? We need to ask ourselves, does our ultimate joy come from being found in Christ? Do we see Christ as supreme? Do we see him as of infinite worth that we want to live our lives as a reflection of his high value and worth? Can I encourage you, spend time in God's word each day. Meditate on in private. Gather with others and read it together. Spend time in prayer and see his infinite worth. Let's reflect on how we spend our time. Does our, our behavior, does our lives reflect our heavenly citizenship? Not only when people are watching, but what about when we're alone? Or what about when opposition comes? See, it's easy enough for us to conduct ourselves when times are good. But what if adversity or persecution came? Would we use this as an excuse? Would we use this as an excuse not to behave in a manner fitting with our heavenly citizenship? Let's ask ourselves, do you seek unity? Do you seek to be united with your brothers and sisters in Christ, or do you deliberately make it your aim to provoke disunity? Are you deliberately standing, or sorry, avoiding standing in unity with your feather, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you only turn up the church when it suits you? Are you happier to step back and let others serve you? Perhaps unwilling to share the gifting God has given you, both for the good of the gospel and for the good of the church. Also, see how Paul's testimony was a great encouragement to the Philippians. It's yet another great reason why we meet on Sunday, because we speak to each other. We speak into our own lives about how God has been at work in us and throughout the world. I also encourage you to read books on the saints. See those who have gone before us. See how the gospel has changed their lives and see the legacy that's been left. See how the gospel has advanced. And let's finally reflect on our own life. Even if you grew up in church, you've, we've all been at some point hostile to the gospel. Perhaps we were even horrible to those who were willing to share the gospel, share the truth. But God worked through this. He used people who knew the infinite worth of Jesus and were willing to suffer to see the, the kingdom advance, to see sinners brought from lot, death to life, sinners like you and me. So let's remember the supremacy of Christ. Let's live lives of gratitude and joy as citizens of heaven together in unity. Let's take comfort. Let's take assurance as we remember our security and God's blessing on us as we proclaim Christ. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for the good news of Jesus Christ and how through his life, his sacrificial death, 
and resurrection, we have been rescued and redeemed. Help us each day to see the infinite worth of being found in Jesus and of our heavenly citizenship. Help us not be divided by trivial or secondary matters, but live united, wanting more people to hear the good news of Jesus and wanting more to come to faith and repentance. We know that as you are proclaimed, opposition will come. uh, Remind us when times of trial or suffering come that the gospel is advanced, it brings assurance of salvation, and most importantly, that you are exalted. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.